Well, good morning. good morning. Wow. I just, I still love coming down here because I remember this place when it was absolutely terrible and busted and ugly, and now it's not. It's wonderful. My wife is, is cueing me. What have I done wrong? Is something wrong? Is, is my zipper up? I'm just curious. I'm just, all right, okay. You know, you get to be 65 and you finally learn to listen to your wife because it's, it's, it's like they have something you need to hear. But uh, it, it, is, it is a delight to be here. And let me say that, you know, we talk about heroes. That's become a big thing in the culture. But I have two heroes of the faith, and their name are Stephen and Elise Law. You know, they, they, and, and, and I really do mean that. This is not just a mutual admiration society. But having known Stephen since he was a college student, watch him grow up, and then watch just how they navigated the situation with, with their daughter. And, you know, it's, it, it was a story about Jesus first and foremost. It was a story about Willow, but it really was a story about the faith of a young couple, Stephen and Elise. And, and I tell you, I watched, I watched God carve some things out in this man's life. During that, during that period of time and subsequent to it. And you have the unique privilege of hearing a man that ministers out of a depth that is beyond just his years. I want you to hear that. And I have such an incredible admiration for Stephen and Elise. Thank you. I mean that. So, thank you. <clears throat> okay, my wife is giving me instructions here. Okay. All right, I've, I've never preached before, so I need all the help I can get. <laughs> you know, each year, as was, as was intimated on the video, I have the privilege of hearing from God as to what God might be saying in this next season. And um, to do that, I really have to look at, go back just for a moment and look at a prophetic prologue. Now, I had to look that word up because I'm not a smart guy. But that word prologue is an event or action that leads to another event or action. And we have been living in a prologue for the past three years. I don't think there's any secret about that. And yes, I'm talking about the events beginning in 2020. But if you're like I am, the events of 2020 became 21 and then became 22. And again, I'm not just talking about the effects of a pandemic, but I'm talking about what for many of us, has been an extended season of dryness, drought, and loss. I think all of you would understand that. I think that, you know, if we were begin to read a passage together like Isaiah 9, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. But, you know, there was another period of time, a three, three and a half year period of time, where God suspended all of the hydration on the planet and plunged, if you wish, the globe into a moment of drought. Actually, it was not the globe that we know of, but the known world. And this was, if you remember Elijah, when he showed up in 1 Kings 17, he prophesied a curse on the land. He said, it will neither, there will be no rain and no dew except at my command. And yet we see at the end of a period of time, three, three and a half years, we see Elijah going to the top of, of Mount Carmel there, and beginning to pray. And it's interesting that he said, I hear the sound of heavy rain. And he sent his servant out to begin to look to see if what he was hearing and what he was seeing were coming into alignment. And I want to say to you that even as God, and we heard this prophesied over and over and over again, that God was dragging his plow through the church and through the nations opening up furrows of preparation that the seeds of revival might go into. I want, to I want you to hear something this morning. We stand here right now, and the sound of heavy rain is upon us. And we stand, and I'm not just saying it because it sounds good to say on a Sunday morning, because I'm not the only person saying this, but I believe that we are on, on the precipice of something that generations have longed to see. And the difference in this one in the first and second great awakenings, that I don't have time to do a history lesson in this moment, is while those two, as great as they were, they affected a particular part 
of, of, of the globe, this is something that I believe God is doing globally. Amen. That God has been opening furrows for himself. He's been opening, tearing open things in the lives of men and women and societies and cultures and nations. So why? So that when God shows up, there'll be no question it's him doing it. Amen. No question at all it's going to be him doing it. And men and women are seeing those clouds of revival. It's a man named Simeon, Luke chapter 2. And God made a promise to him. It says, you will not die until you see with your own eyes the consolation of Israel. That's a pretty good CV. It says he was a man full of the Spirit. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. My wife and I were, have had the privilege of ministering in a conference in Maui. Somebody has to do it. Uh, for the past really 20, almost 25 years now. And there's a man that really was, was instrumental in helping just start that conference. This, man, this man's name is Emmanuel Canastracy. You don't know that name? Don't worry about it. But Emmanuel Canastracy, as a teenager, rolled into the driveway of a man named William Branham, one of the great revivalists, quite frankly, of probably history. And he refused to leave for three days until Branham let him in his house. And Branham, he traveled with Branham. For many years, miracle power of God was on, is, is on this man. He met his wife because he laid hands on her as a teenager. God healed her of leukemia. I guess, you know, if you lay hands on somebody and you heal, they, they were obligated to marry you. I guess we have to get married now. So it's kind of a different twist on that story. So, but in 20, let me see if I can get the dates right. In 2021, Manuel Canastracy was preaching in this conference and I told my wife, I said, he's ill. He said he has cancer and it's serious. Now, this is a man at that time who was 89 years old. And about 30 days after that conference ended, he was diagnosed with cancer. Now, when you're 89, 90 years old, most of the time they say you've lived a good long life. And so the medical profession just kind of backs off and they're not aggressive in their treatment. Came back in 2022 and he got up there and he was cancer free cancer-free. Excuse me? And he survived chemo. He actually... Well, he went through chemo and survived, survived the treatment, but God touched him. But he got up and he gave this testimony. He said, God told me. And let me tell you, this is a man that when God told you, God told you. He said, God told me I would not die until I saw with my own eyes the outpouring of this next revival. And so when you hear a man that's walked with God like that, that intimately for that period of time, and realize that God had sustained his life, that like Simeon, he would see something with his own eyes before God was finished with him. You and I live in that same moment. We live in that very, very same moment. But you might say, well, but Pastor Jim, I don't see it. I don't see it with my own natural eyes. All I know is that, you know, my job's in jeopardy. I'm still married to the Antichrist. I'm not convinced that my children are not the spawn of the devil himself sometimes. You know, I, 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 live, in, I live in the D.C. area. God can't even be found in this spot. Let me just tell you, God needs to open our eyes that we see something beyond just what we are assessing in the natural. This is good. This is really, really tricky. You know, in 2 Kings chapter 3, there's a story of some kings that come into an alliance. They find themselves in the desert. They finally get a prophet. They're out of water. The prophet says, make this valley full of ditches, for you will see neither wind nor rain, yet I will fill it with water. Let me just tell you, we might not see the wind nor the rain the way we've seen it in the past, but God is going to fill our valleys. He's going to fill our ditches. He's going to fill the low places in our lives and in the lives of others in a way that we've never seen before. But what's paramount is that our spiritual senses become attuned. Because if we're only assessing them basing on, based on what we see in the natural, we might very well miss what God is doing in this season. Matthew chapter 25 we find this passage, we find this parable, a very famous parable. 
verses 1 through 13. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read the passage, but you know the story. Ten virgins. And they are waiting for the bridegroom to arrive. And five, we find that there were two groups. There were five that brought extra oil for the lamps and five that didn't. It says at midnight, it says the bridegroom was a long time in coming. Don't we feel that way so many times? Uh, so that, that Jesus is just slow showing up for our situation. And it says they became drowsy and they fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. The bridegroom, come out to meet him. And all the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. And they said, nope, there may not be enough for both of us. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. And the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later they came back, and they said, sir, open the door. But he said, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour. Lord, help us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour in Jesus' name. I have a very unhealthy, unhappy relationship with oil. My wife and I had a Vista Cruiser. Now, if you don't know what a Vista Cruiser is, watch the, the 70s show. Okay? It was made by Oldsmobile. It was a cutlass station wagon. Only the geezers on the front row know what I'm talking about. Okay. So my wife and I had this car. It was the family, it was, it was the, the, the family uh, truckster. And we were on the way to church, and I had noticed a red light on my dash that just came on. It just kept coming on. It was close to Christmas, and I thought, this is delightful. Look at this. Got Christmas lights on my dash. <laughs> Until finally that one Sunday that the car just said, we're done. And the engine seized up, and we rolled over to the side of the road. I had a friend of mine who was a mechanic. He was in the church, and he had pulled the, my oil pan off. And I said, well, what's going on with my car? And he handed me my oil. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you're not supposed to be able to hand somebody their oil. All right, it doesn't work that way. But the oil had been so congealed, I just thought that, you know, somehow just angels or something changed the oil in your car. You know, they did check the oil in your, and so the engine had ceased. It just stopped because I just made it, I just took it for granted the oil would always be there. But what about your oil this morning? What is the condition of your oil. Now, we look at these, if we, if we return to the parable, we look at both groups. Both groups of, of virgins, they were both qualified. They were virgins. Both had the same information and the same revelation. He's coming. They were in the right place at the right time. Now, I want you to look here. Because the correlation between many people in the church qualified the righteousness of Christ, the blood of Jesus. They had the same revelation of what we're hearing right now. And they were both in anticipation of an amazing event. And yet, only one group was able to enter into that promise. They both, both groups, they got tired. They got weary in the delay. And both groups fell asleep. Yet only one group able to participate. Why? Because of preparation rather than just expectation. You see, sometimes we think that the real essence of faith, if it's just expectation, I'm believing it. But the question is, it's expectation plus preparation is where faith is found. It's one thing to have a word. It's the one thing to have revelation. It's one thing to know something, to really desire something, to stand on the promises of this word. But the question is, what are we doing in preparation for the deliverance of that word into that promise. Are we preparing 
is this coming together? And for many of us, there may be an expectation of revival or what this awakening might look like. Pentecost. The sound of rushing wind, tongues of fire. But saints, let me tell you, there was nothing in the law and the prophets written about what this outpouring would look like. There was no written recordation. There was, to the best of our knowledge, there was nothing in the oral tradition that said this is what it will be. To the point that those there, some got it, some didn't. We know that because some began to worship God in an unknown tongue. Others were saying they drunk. So we know in that same moment, in that same location, the Holy Spirit fell on one group and another group completely missed it. Oh my goodness. We look at the history of contemporary char- the, the, the contemporary charismatic movement. Early 1960s, God offered it through the Catholic Church. He offered it through the denominational church. Dennis Bennett, an Anglican, was actually the one that coined the phrase, gentlemen, we are charismatics. It came from an Anglican. And the Holy Spirit came and began to offer himself in these historical denominational structures. But many of these denominations said, we've gone far enough. This is what we believe about the Trinity, particularly the Holy Spirit. We believe we've got our liturgy down. It's worked for us for decades, if not centuries. Therefore, we don't really need this movement and this outpouring. And the Holy Spirit just said, fine, I'll find a group that does. Let me say this to you. Leonard Ravenhill, I believe it was him that said this. I can't quantify the quote, can't qualify it. But he said, the real danger that those of us who are charismatics and Pentecostals, this is our real danger, is that we know so much about God that we stand in danger of missing the next move of God. We can say, yeah, but we believe in all this stuff. I'm not a cessationist. I'm a continuationist. I believe that God is still continuing to do all of these things. But you know, many of us, we may be theological charismatic, but we're functional cessationists in terms of what it really looks like on a day-in, day-out basis to walk, to participate in the life of the Spirit as one of our courses has been so called. What does it look like? This next move of God might not look like what the previous move of God looked like. And we all have this paradigm. We all have this idea, this notion. Certainly this is how God will do a thing. But how many of you have walked with God long enough to know that rarely will God do what you think he's going to do, the way he's going to do it, and particularly when he's going to do it? Somebody said it this way, is that God will offend the mind to reveal the heart. Well, God, I thought. Yeah, well, you thought wrong. I love you a bunch, but it was carnal thinking. But what if it doesn't look like what it's looked like before? I asked my finance guy, you know, my $17 I had in my retirement account that's now worth 17 cents. And, of course, he's trying to reassure, you know, all the little quips, time in the market, and blah, 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 you know, all of this. And he said, you know, the, 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 the bulls always follow the bears. And if you look at historical trends, and I said, what if this is an, a historical trend? What if it doesn't happen this way the way it's happened before? So what does it look like? You see, in a largely narcissistic culture, which has created this narcissistic gospel, That says, it's about me. We package revival as to how it's going to benefit me. Let me ask you a tough question this morning. What if this next move of God doesn't personally benefit you? Will you still call it God? 
You may say, well, that's a conflict right there, Pastor Jim, because certainly any outpouring of God is going to benefit me. It's going to, my body is going to be healed. There's going to be more money that's going to flow through my coffers. My children are going to rise up and call me blessed. I mean, there's going to be some manifestation where I'm going to receive benefit. Read your Bible. Book of Acts 2, 3, 4. Yes, miracles, signs, and wonders, and many coming to the, to, to, to the knowledge of Christ, but against what kind of backdrop? Horrendous persecution. Yeah. Yeah. Arguably, the greatest revival in history is happening right now and has been. Where? Mainland China. I don't think you could dispute. The millions and millions of people that have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ against the backdrop of what? Horrendous persecution. We can say, well, certainly God is going to Christianize all areas of our culture, and it's going to be this glorious thing, and, you know, the Shekinah glory of God is going to shine over the cap. Maybe not. It may not happen that way. Oh, 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 oh. There are going to be unique aspects of this outpouring. That God's going to fall in one place and yet not fall in another. I was ministering in Europe some years ago, and I began to see lights begin to twinkle on in certain cities, and even churches within those cities. And I began to realize as a light was dawning across that continent, which has been dark for so long, it wasn't going to be this immediate outpouring of light. And let me say to you that for some people, even sitting on the same row of the church, revival is going to come here. It's going to be missed over here. Have you ever been in a service and people walked away and one person's testimony was, wow, God was in the middle of that. And somebody else walked away from the same moment and said, meh, amazing. And this revival is going to be very, very much like that. And it's important that we don't miss the day of visitation because the external circumstances don't seem to align with it. What do I mean by that? You know, we've bought into this idea. Theologically, it's known as triumphalism. The way it's worked itself into our political climate is now called Christian nationalism. That all of a sudden that we're going to define revival as what I call institutional revival. That many of us drank this Kool-Aid many, many years ago. That God is going to Christianize every part of the culture. Every institution, the seven mountains, if you wish, that God is going to come and he's going to inhabit all of these places. And there's going to be this amazing institutional revival. But what if God doesn't do it that way? Will we still call it revival? Hmm, you ain't got it yet, but stay with me. You know, what we don't see as a result of Pentecost. Rome being affected. Rome continued to do exactly what Rome did. And it continued to persecute the church. We don't see institutional revival recorded in Scripture for the most part. And so how do we do this? How do we prepare and participate? As I've already said, it's expectation plus preparation is where we get the manifestation of living in a moment like this. We find a subsequent story in 2 Kings, the fourth chapter. I mentioned the third, now I'm going to mention the fourth. And the prophet Elisha goes to the widow of a prophet. She's broke. And in those days, you didn't get to file chapter 7, 9, 11, 13, 17, whatever. They came and got your kids and sold them into slavery. And the prophet comes and he says, what do you have in your house? And she says initially nothing. But then she recants a minute and said, I probably shouldn't lie to a prophet. I was married to one. I do have a little oil. Now listen to this preparation. He said, go get every container you can find. Go knock on doors. Go, go to your neighbors. Get every container you can find. 
and then bring it back. And she does as she was instructed. And she begins to pour this oil out. Now, you know the story. She poured it out and it kept coming. Where's it connected to? It just kept coming. And she told her sons, she said, bring me another container. They brought another. She continued to flow. And as long as there were empty containers available, what happened? The oil kept flowing. But when all the containers were filled, what happened? The oil stopped. You know, I'm convinced that thousands of years later, I'm convinced if there could have been generationally empty containers in front of that oil, I'm convinced that oil would still be flowing today. It would still be flowing. And so what do we, what do we derive from this by way of preparation? You know, many of us, we've been running on empty. You know, we live in a culture, there's a, we've heard of FOMO, but I believe there's a FORO, which is a fear of running out. It's why God created Amazon Prime and Costco. <laughs> but we live in a day of many, you know, of, of many storage and the, the container store and Marie Kondo. I mean, we're terrified that we're going to run out. And yet Matthew 5 says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they're the ones that are going to get filled. The problem is we get hungry, we get thirsty, and we immediately begin to rebuke the devil. Shandai! Certainly this, this feeling that I'm feeling can't be God. Oh my goodness. You know, there's a phenomenon that nothing tastes good when you're full. I mean, you can sit there and you can have three or four Happy Meals and then sit down at Morton's and you'll be pushing the steak away simply because you're full. You know, the challenge for many of us is that we're so full, there's no room for the oil to flow because of foro, of the fear of running out. And so we fill ourselves with amusement, entertainment, YouTube videos, Instagram. <coughs> Excuse me. We're constantly pouring something else in there. And let me say this to you. God will empty you. Now stay with me. Because this is not a happy truth. Now God will use Satan in the process. He said, I don't believe you, Pastor Jim. Just read the book of Job. I mean, this is a righteous guy by God's own testimony, and then he turns Satan loose for about 40 chapters to just empty this man's life. And I got to tell you, as much as I hold the right respect for the power of the devil, I have a greater fear of God because the devil can't do anything unless God allows him to do it. And watching how God will sometimes turn our lives upside down and empty us. And if we're there rebuking the devil, we are, in essence, rebuking God's process of saying, son, let me make some space in your life for more of me. Yeah. And to do that, I may have to take out what you think are some really great things in order for the greater thing, which is me, in order to have space. Right. And let me just tell you something. God will do it because he loves you. The same way as a parent, you will take something away from your child for a moment in order to give them something better and greater. Tozer said, it's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. My goodness. Are you fillable? Readying the vessel. Let me say it's never an oil problem. It's always a vessel problem. The oil is something that's divine as God begins to pour it out. The issue is not only is there any room, but is there a flexibility? Some years ago, I preached a series, a, a message on, on the wineskin. And a wineskin, an ancient methodology for moving liquids made literally from the skin of a dead animal. The challenge with as disgusting as that sounds, this was before Yeti, obviously, <laughs> but as disgusting as that sounds, 
is that that wineskin was at its place of maximum flexibility closest to the time of death of the animal from which it was taken. So there's a connection between our mortality, our flexibility, and our flexibility and our capacity. Some of the death you've been experiencing, even around your own lives, is God preparing your wineskin to stretch, to be able to receive more in this coming season that he's pouring out for you. You can't rely on somebody else's oil. Drafting in their relationship, drafting in their Bible study, whatever it might be. Oh, that Pastor Stephen, he just reads his Bible every day. He's amazing. I love sitting under his pulpit. Yeah, but how long does his pulpit take you through your week? Are you relying on someone else's anointing? Someone else's prayer, someone else's study of the word, someone else's relationship with the Holy Spirit. You can't run on somebody else's oil. You've got to uniquely get your own. And then recognizing what you have and releasing it. What do you have? I ain't got nothing. Well, I I guess I can't say that. I, I, I guess I have the Holy Spirit. Well, if, if, mm-hmm. Let me tell you, you have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Otherwise, you couldn't claim your salvation right. if the Holy Spirit had moved into your life. Are you with me? Yes. And so, is it, well, I guess I got a little oil. Yes, you do. Now the question is, what do you do with what you have? Right. But you see, the phenomena is, as we release as we pour out what God has given us, then there's the miracle of replication and multiplication. As we begin to tell our story, preach, prophesy, as we begin to allow the Holy, the Holy Spirit expression through our life, God says, watch this. He pours and he pours and he pours. And it doesn't matter how fast we pour out, as long as there's some space... God will keep coming. But for many of us, we top off our tanks and we say, all for me, baby. Because we've packaged much of what we do in the contemporary church as to me getting mine. My wife and I were in a move of God in the mid-90s and it became more, became the battle cry. Remember this, Pastor Mark? More, more, more. And it sounds great. And my wife and I, we were pastoring a church in the midst of this unique sort of outpouring of God. We watched people come to the altar and they stopped, dropped and rolled and laughed and they had the best time. And they got full. There's only one problem. They didn't do anything with the oil. And at the end of two years, they looked the same at the end that they did at the beginning. And this oil had no effect whatsoever in our city because it never moved. It never got poured out. As great as what God is doing in this church and in our grace churches. It's not enough to fill this room up. It's not enough to get you a little happier, a little healthier, a little bit more filled. It's about what do we do with what God has poured into us. Hmm. And the promise is like that widow. If we'll pour out, God will continue to pour in. That's the principle. And watch this. And I'm closing with this. He said, sell the oil, pay off your debts, and live on what's left. Do you realize that in that moment of obedience, God moved her from financial health to wealth? Sometimes we don't pay any attention to this. We just think, great, she got her credit card bill paid. (laughs) Woo, baby, visa, goodbye. This was more than debt reduction. Live on what's left. Now, I don't know about you, but can you imagine God delivering resources to you in such a way that says, you ain't got to work no more. You wealthy now. God, in an instant, moved her from a place of complete 
desperation into a place of absolute wealth. Wow. And in the midst of all of the talk about depression and recession and stagflation and whatever word they can create to scare us to death economically, I believe that there is one of the greatest transfers of wealth that God is going to bring to the church. Not the entire, quote, church, but the real church that understands this principle of release. I believe it's coming. And I believe for churches, there are two containers that God is looking for uniquely. The very first is prayer. You know why? Because I believe when prayer, when it's done right, empties us. You can't pray a prayer like, thy will be done, and it not be prerequisite to that prayer. That means I've got to release my will for thy will. That means I've got to empty myself of my plans, my purposes, my desires, that God might actually give me his prayer is one of those containers. The second container, I believe, is getting out of the house and looking, looking for empty containers. And who are they? The lost. I can't see a more beautiful picture of what it means to pour that oil into an empty container than as we find somebody that's completely desolate, completely depleted, And we find those empty containers and say, watch this. And we begin to pour. We begin to watch God use us, anoint our stories, anoint our testimonies, anoint us with words of knowledge and intercession in ways that maybe we've never seen before. And if we will just get ourselves next to these empty vessels, God will say, watch this. And we'll begin to watch something begin to flow out of our lives that maybe we've never seen before before and God's going to do it he's going to do it so saints it comes down to a simple question this morning survival or revival and it's really nothing in between you've got Christians that they're they're in this this white knuckled moment (laughs) rebuking the devil trying to find God And they're just white-knuckled as to what is coming in the earth. The Gospels say men's hearts failing them for fear of what's coming in the earth. And yet, that's not your testimony and mine. Because I believe what's coming to the earth is the sound of heavy rain. Do you realize that God is allowing, hear me, you and me, the privilege of being alive in this moment. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Things that others have just desired just to peek into. That's right. That generation that saw God manifested in the flesh as Jesus showed up. <coughs> blessed was that generation, but let me say to you, blessed is this generation because we're about to see something other generations before us have only had a whiff of. And God is inserting us right in the middle of it. In this moment, what is the condition of your wineskin this morning? You say, Pastor Jim, I'm just tired of all this death. I hate to tell you this, but congratulations. You know, there's this kingdom principle we don't talk about much. We love resurrection, we just don't like the prerequisite for it. And the more life you experience is directly relational to the amount of death you're willing to embrace in the moment. And some of you just feel like, I got nothing left to give. Good. I feel so empty. Good. Blessed are they. Because God's coming to fill. Let's pray. Lord, help us here well this morning. God, we stand here this morning doing what we know to do to empty ourselves. Some of us come and we we can readily acknowledge that. But Lord, we receive today. 
your filling. God, we receive our mandate in this moment to take the oil that we have, even that which we think we don't, and to be faithful to pour out that which we do and to watch the miracle of replication, multiplication, as the oil continues to flow. Lord, open our eyes and open our ears, not toward Fox and CNN, but toward the testimony of heaven as to what you are doing in this moment. Touch our eyes. Touch our ears. Make us the spiritual men and women that you died that we would be.